was one of the most feared rulers in history. Ivan the Terrible, the first Tsar of all the Russias. He was a torturer, a murderer, a rapist. Definitely a psychopath. But legend says the ruthless tyrant had a secret. A library of priceless books, hidden in the labyrinths beneath the Kremlin. Ivan the Terrible's library is, is really one of the great underground myths. The mythical library contained the greatest lost works of ancient literature. In the 20th century, one man set out to prove it really existed. If it was discovered, it would transform our knowledge of the past. It was a journey into the darkest terrors of the Soviet Union. Stiletsky was really a man bordering on, on, on obsession. He also had to be brave, of course. His terrifying enemy, the forces of Stalin's secret police. Stiletsky was crazy. He don't go looking for secrets of the Soviet Union. It was a deadly treasure hunt, where the ultimate prize was knowledge. We are talking about a man who is seriously prepared to risk his life. This is the story of the quest for Ivan the Terrible's library. The legend of Ivan the Terrible's library began far from Russia in 15th century Constantinople. The capital of the Byzantine Empire was the dazzling center of European culture. It is the power engine that drives Christian Europe. This is a world where there is a real premium on scholarship and on learning. One of the city's greatest treasures was said to be its magnificent library, home to priceless masterpieces of ancient Greek and Roman literature. Legend says the books were bound in gold. In those days, of course, books were extremely valuable. Books typically would be encrusted by jewels or would have beautiful decorations on them that were objects of enormous beauty as well as of, of scholarship. But in 1453, the empire fell to Muslim invaders. It's a heartbreaking moment. Churches being converted into mosques, books disappearing, jewels being sacked, men and women being pressed into slavery. The whole story is a very difficult and painful one. To escape the dying city, the emperor's niece, Sophia, was married to a Russian prince. The legend says that 800 precious books went with her to Moscow. books that Sophia brought over, if they were discovered now, would probably triple the volume of Greek or Roman literature available to us. But it was Sophia's grandson who created the legend of the library. In 1547, Ivan the Terrible became the Tsar of Russia. He was a tyrant and sadist who reveled bizarre forms of torture. He only ever laughed when uh, observing tortures. He would have people skinned alive, for example. They would be put into, uh, into boiling water and then into ice water, and then their skin would be just pulled off. But despite his cruelty, Ivan was a man of learning and sophistication knowledge-hungry person, ahead of his times, you know, um, multilinguist, polymath. Poet, a musician, uh, a theologian, a philosopher, and he established the first printing press in Russia. According to legend, the scholarly Ivan took extreme measures to guard his precious library. He hid it away, deep beneath the Kremlin. in a man-made labyrinth of tunnels formed by sealing off Moscow's underground rivers. The secret location of the library changer was known only to a trusted few. But Ivan's reign descended 
into paranoia. No one was safe, not even his own family. The legend says that Ivan killed anyone who knew of the secret location of the library. He even murdered his son. Finally, Ivan himself died during a game of chess. He took his greatest secret to the grave. And that looked like the end of the line. Everybody who knew about the library and the places where it could have been hidden was now dead. By the 20th century, there was no evidence that the library had ever existed. Most Russian academics thought it was a legend and nothing more. But in 1912, an ambitious archaeologist set out to prove them wrong. He didn't think it was just uh, any old mystery. He believed with every fiber of his body that the library actually existed and that he was going to find it. Ignaty Stiletsky was raised in the Ukraine, but he learned his trade in the ancient city of Jerusalem. While exploring its warren of underground caves and tunnels, he'd first heard tell of the legend of Ivan's library. It brought him to Moscow and put his subterranean skills to the ultimate test. Stoletsky solved mysteries by digging. Stoletsky used to tap his way along the walls, trying to listen for change in the, uh, in the sound, in the resonance of the rock that may have indicated a cavity or space behind that he could dig into. Stoletsky thought the academics of the Russian establishment were afraid to get their hands dirty. Finding Ivan the Terrible's library was a job for a seasoned underground expert. It must have been like a red flag to a bull, really. When, when the establishment tell you that it doesn't exist, that must be incredibly exciting for an ambitious, pushy young scholar. It was his obsession throughout his adult life to find uh, that library. Stoletsky planned to dig beneath the walls of the Kremlin. But his first step was to target the likeliest location where Ivan might have hidden his library. The research you do before going underground is the intellectual challenge. It's a puzzle you're trying to put the pieces together. The final piece of the puzzle is the dig, is going underground itself. Stoletsky's starting point was a map of the Kremlin that charted the building in the 16th century. A sprawling citadel of towers, cathedrals, and military buildings. Kremlin is a mini city, like so many fortified towns in the West. It was supposed uh, to uh, basically to harbor the whole population of the town with all the infrastructure in place. Finding the library was a daunting task. The Kremlin covered an area of more than three million square feet. But by piecing together snippets of information, Stoletsky created a second and far more specialized map. It was a rough outline of the Kremlin's vast and ancient network of underground tunnels. Ivan had used it to hide his library and to hide himself in times of trouble. There were lots of tunnels built for security reasons because uh, those were not vegetarian times in Russian history and there were fre frequent uprising in which everybody would be cut to little pieces. You know. Stoletsky noticed that the tunnels seemed to converge beneath one of the Kremlin's most famous landmarks. He decided that this building, the Arsenal Tower, would be his number one target in the quest for Ivan's library. The Arsenal Tower was probably the most uh, prominent one, and it was also the most likely place under which the treasure could be hidden. Stoletsky looked deeper into the tower's history, and it soon became clear that he was on the right track. 
Sirisky discovered he wasn't the first man to dig under the Arsenal tower in the Kremlin. In the 18th century, the Russian nobleman Prince Mikhail Sherbatov had blazed a trail for Stiletsky to follow. Beneath the Arsenal Tower, he discovered a gateway to the secret labyrinth beyond. Exploring further, he found the tunnels were lined with distinctive white stone. Sherbatov never found Ivan's library, but his story gave Stiletsky vital clues. Stravinsky definitely thought he could do better than Shubatov because Shubatov never did find the library and Stravinsky thought he would. Stravinsky now knew he had to find Sherbatov's gate. If he could break through it, a labyrinth of white stone would mark the way to the library. Stravinsky thought that every time he could see a white stone, he is on the right track. Stravinsky was ready to search the Kremlin but he'd be taking his life in his hands. In 1912, revolution was in the air. Ruthless oppression by the Tsar Nicholas II had earned him the nickname Bloody Nicholas. His fearsome secret police had the Kremlin under tight control. Throughout the reign of, of Nicholas II, uh, there was a very real danger of a revolutionary outburst. I mean, his own grandfather was blown in half by, by a bomb. So he had the secret police, and uh, therefore anybody digging in the darkness of tunnels on, on the Kremlin was bound to be seen as a, at least a potential subversive. Stiletsky hit on a subterfuge. He offered to do an archaeological survey of the Arsenal Tower's basement. His team were kept under close supervision, with the deeper levels of the building strictly out of bounds. But Stiletsky waited for the guards and workers to take their lunch break, then slipped out of sight. He realized only too well that by doing so he was risking his life. Uh, but for someone who is obsessed, uh, this can actually be an attraction. There was an iron stairwell leading deep below the tower. To Stiletsky's amazement, Sherbatov's gate was at the bottom. The ancient bars were rusted through. The hunt for the library chamber was on. For Stoletsky, it was a challenge. Here, he could test his skills. Stoletsky had to work fast before his absence was noted. And exploring further, his attention was drawn to the floor. Scraping away layers of gravel and earth, he made a tantalizing discovery. There was a cavity which revealed the secret labyrinth below. But there was no time to find a way down. He still had some common sense left. Doing so would mean an immediate arrest. Stiletsky got back in the nick of time. To investigate the tunnels in safety, he knew he would need official permission. The Kremlin, after all, is a, is a fortress, and it always has been. You need to have the benediction of the ruling elite to be allowed anywhere near, and to go and look and see what's there. But the academic establishment was blocking Stiletsky's way. Its most eminent figure was Professor Sergei Belokurov. Belokurov was that sort of uh, scientist, Russian scientist, let's say, it, uh, who were always very careful uh, who were always very careful not to raise their head above water, because in Russia, the moment you raise your head above water, it gets hit. Belakurov had written an official report dismissing the library as a myth. So there would be no digging in the Kremlin, unless Stiletsky came
came up with hard evidence of the library's existence. The Lacouve was a real authority on the subject. So as far as the Russian scientists were concerned, the matter was closed. I mean, there was no library, and that was it. Stiletsky vowed to prove them all wrong. Faith is important, and that is part of Stiletsky's crusade, really. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's motivated by a deep belief that these books really did exist once upon a time and that they can be found. Stiletsky planned to reinvestigate a key story from Belokurov's report. In the 16th century, an Estonian scholar named Johann Vetterman had reputedly seen the library itself. Ivan the Terrible had invited him to translate its ancient masterpieces from the original Greek and Latin. But having learned the secret of the library, Vetterman was now in fear for his life. He was a clever man and he was terrified. Well, Ivan the Terrible has a, has a truly terrible reputation and uh, he's renowned for acts of extraordinary cruelty. Vetterman pretended to start his task, then made good his escape from Moscow. But not before making a list of all the books he could remember. Vetterman's list had supposedly resurfaced in 19th century Estonia, but had now disappeared. Belokurov thought the story was fiction. Stiletsky aimed to prove it was fact. He didn't believe Belokurov's conclusions. Stiletsky headed 500 miles from Moscow to the last known location of Vetterman's list. The town library in Perno, one of the oldest towns in Estonia. But after years of neglect, its storerooms were in disarray. It was a mess. Everything was scattered around and actually quite a lot of effort was needed to find what he was looking for. You can imagine that this library was chock full of nuts, meaning uh, scrolls, rolls, books, scraps of paper. Things were by no means easy to find there. Stiletsky was drowning in a sea of dusty books and reams of paper. He didn't even know what Vetterman's list would look like. But because Stoletsky was convinced he was going to find the catalog, he kept digging and digging and digging and digging. The breakthrough finally came when a tattered fragment of paper caught Stoletsky's eye. It was a string of illustrious names. And the list was initialed with the Russian form of the letter V. The letter V at the bottom, which could mean only one thing, Vetterman, Eureka, he found it. Stiletsky was dumbfounded. Vetterman's list was a roll call of the greatest authors of antiquity. Vetterman's list, it's one of those sort of totally unbelievable lists. Every treasure that we don't have in Latin and Greek literature is on it. The list contained a hundred unknown volumes of Livy's histories of the Roman Empire. And there were lost works of ancient Greek drama. The idea that we could find plays by Aristophanes that aren't known about or, or are known but are lost, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Finally, Vetterman listed missing pages from the 12 biographies of Caesar by the historian Suetonius. It looks like a list of what a historian would like to find if he was let into the great sweet shop of history. If Stiletsky could find Ivan's library, he would literally change human history. It would transform our knowledge of the past. I mean, I think you'd lick your, lick your chops if you had any hope of catching a few pages of one of these texts. The idea that you might find all of them together, it's astonishing. But 
now Stiletsky made a fateful mistake. He left Vetterman's list behind and took his own copy back to Moscow, certain that no one could now stand in his way. If you have a catalogue, it proves that Belokurov was wrong and Stoletsky was right. But to Stoletsky's disbelief, he still couldn't find a historian who would take him seriously. No one would risk their reputation on a scrap of paper. Stoletsky didn't even have the original list in his hands. Stoletsky had been given the chance of a lifetime and he bungled it. Access to the Kremlin was denied. And there was no second chance. In 1914, Russia was hurled into World War I. Swept up in the tide of history, Stiletsky was banished from Moscow and sent to the front. The war was a disaster for Russia and for the Tsar. The Tsar was badly prepared for conflict. Entire Russian armies were annihilated. At home, the country exploded into violent revolution. For ordinary people, the only priority was survival. When the Bolshevik revolution swept through Russia, Russia was essentially destroyed. I mean, uh, millions were dying or starving to death or emigrating. Great historical buildings were, were being uh, razed to the ground. In the turmoil, Stoletsky's quest for Ivan the Terrible's library was totally irrelevant. With that kind of cataclysm unfolding, a lowly little library was of little interest to anybody, and Stelitsky must have feared that that was it. Who cares about the library, even if it was the Tsar's library? Who cares about books? Books were only good for throwing into the oven to make yourself warm. The victorious Bolsheviks murdered the Tsar and took power in Moscow. For ordinary citizens, the times were more dangerous than ever. The Bolsheviks, uh, they were ready to see counter-revolution everywhere. For seven years, Stiletsky kept his head down. His obsession with the Kremlin could only attract deadly suspicion. He was still an archaeologist, but now he had to become a careful archaeologist. Anybody dealing with the Bolsheviks had, had to be good at playing the game because the bad players get shot. Stiletsky's only chance of survival was to adapt to the new Soviet Union. Stiletsky realizes that to be able to carry on with this project, he has to become what in modern terms we call politically correct. In 1924, Stiletsky was ready to renew his quest by campaigning in the communist newspapers. He claimed that underground exploration would reveal the treasures of Russia and give them back to the people. He wanted to sound like a good Marxist, taking treasures from the rich and giving them back to the poor. Stiletsky proclaimed, the time has come to turn underground Moscow inside out. His timing was perfect. The communists themselves were already digging up the city. The new Moscow metro would make Russia the envy of the world. It was the ultimate expression of Soviet power under its sinister new leader, Joseph Stalin. There was now a new czar in the Kremlin named Joseph Stalin, and he wanted to immortalize his czardom by, by building the greatest engineering 
works known to man, which is the underground network under the city known as the Moscow Metro. Stiletsky was made an official archaeologist on the Metro excavations. His task? To assess any unexpected discoveries by the engineers. The tunnels were full of the flotsam and jetsam of Moscow's ancient history. Shards of pottery had somehow found their way down from the city's kitchens. But secretly, Stiletsky was hunting for bigger game. Ivan the Terrible's library. Stiletsky thought he probably could latch on to the tail end of the project and, uh, and do his own thing. The metro was extending Moscow's ancient labyrinth with 50 miles of new tunnels. They even penetrated beneath the Kremlin itself. Whenever he had the chance, Stiletsky listened for hollow walls and the library chamber. But with Stalin's agents everywhere, he was playing a very dangerous game. This was really very brave, dicing with death. He was now at the very heart of the system, swarming uh, with uh, secret policemen. Stalin ruled the Soviet Union by terror. By the late 1920s, he was gathering all the reins of power in his own hands. His image and statues dominated the streets. All opposition was ruthlessly hunted down by his vast network of secret police. Stalin is generally believed to be paranoid. He lived in constant fear of, of, of assassination. Anyone working beneath the Kremlin would be under suspicion. And as Stiletsky homed in on the Arsenal Tower, his finds were turning sinister. The workers were terrified to discover skeletons beneath their shovels, unidentified victims of some ancient crime. For Stiletsky, it was a daily reminder of Moscow's violent past. It was very dangerous to, to keep doing what he was doing, but nevertheless, he kept listening, kept putting his ears to the walls uh, and listening and listening and listening, risking his life every single moment. By 1933, Stalin had assumed total control of the Communist Party. The rule of law was replaced by the word of a single man. Stalin now had the power of life and death over every citizen of the Soviet Union. No one was immune from disappearing from the street or from one's flat in broad daylight or at night. Uh, no one, not even the people who shouted louder than everyone else, long live Comrade Stalin. In this terrifying climate, Stiletsky's chance to find the library finally arrived. Word came through of a serious accident underground, close to the Arsenal Tower. Stiletsky raced to the scene. The metro excavations had caused a massive collapse, all the way through to street level. But for Stiletsky, it was a godsend. Because the collapsing tunnel walls had also revealed a hidden passage. Stiletsky was certain they had broken through to Ivan's secret labyrinth. But when he finally got there, he was desperate to investigate. But the workers wouldn't let him come near. The collapse had brought Moscow to a standstill. Stalin's henchmen in the Kremlin couldn't move their cars. That's a very serious, one would say potentially lethal problem for the engineers, because one thing they have to do above all, is to keep the traffic flowing for the party bosses in the Kremlin. The terrified engineers were racing to repair the damage. They didn't care much about secret passageways. What they did care about was staying alive. There was nothing Stalecki could do. Stalin's men were in control. 
Stalecki was absolutely devastated. That was the chance he had been waiting for for so long, and now it looked like he had lost it. Stalecki's dream was in tatters. The breakthrough was sealed for good. That must have been a shattering blow to, to Stilitsky. So near, yet so far. Right then, Stilitsky decided to stake his life on one last desperate gamble. Somehow, he had to get Stalin's regime to back his quest for the library. And he realized that Ivan the Terrible himself could show him the way. Stilecki planned to exploit a curious story about the Tsar. During Ivan's reign in the 16th century, he'd made frequent trips to the forests west of the Kremlin. His companions were trusted members of his personal bodyguard. But they would come back from the woods alone, with an unbelievable tale to tell. Ivan wanted to cultivate an awesome, uh, almost supernatural image. According to the story, Ivan would simply vanish, as if by magic. He would later reappear in the Kremlin palaces, as if nothing had happened. He did want people to believe he had almost demonic powers that could vanish in thin air and appear out of thin air. Stiletsky knew better, of course. Ivan had used a secret tunnel to spirit himself away. Stiletsky published the story in a Moscow newspaper. Ivan's tunnel was clearly a dangerous breach in Stalin's security, and Stiletsky claimed only he could find it. He is now going for broke he decides to make all his findings public. That was really like playing hide and seek with death. He's really burning his bridges all, all over the place and they're, they're ablaze. There's really no way back. It was a message Stalin's henchmen couldn't ignore. And it wasn't long before they had Stiletsky in their sights. The voice there says, Comrade Stiletsky? You're digging in the tunnels. is starting to disturb us. The menacing voice on the line was one of Stalin's most ruthless security chiefs. Rudolf Pettersson was the commandant of the Kremlin itself. A brutal enforcer with the power of life and death. He was responsible for, for the continuing good health of the Soviet leaders. That job was frightening for him, and he himself was a very frightening man. He personally would butcher people. Patterson wanted to know all the secrets of the Kremlin's past. Terrified, Stiletsky told him about Ivan the Terrible's library and the tunnels leading from the Arsenal Tower. But then Patterson gave him the surprise of his life. He was afraid of being arrested. But, like it often happens in Russian history, a sudden, unexpected turn of events. Instead of that, he was given a carte blanche for excavations under the Kremlin and even access to the Arsenal Tower. Patterson wanted help to find the tunnels and close the breach in Kremlin security. Stiletsky could hardly believe his luck. He told his diary I have the bluebird of happiness in my hands. At 10 o'clock on the 13th of November, 1933, I will finally be allowed back into the Kremlin. More than 20 years after his first visit, Stiletsky re-entered the basement of the Arsenal Tower. But this time, there was no need to hide. He had Pettersson's blessing and a team of engineers. His mission? To map out the Kremlin's secret tunnels and find Ivan the Terrible's library. He can't believe his luck. It's like a miracle. He's got the keys to the Kremlin now. 
Everything was just as Stoletsky had left it in 1912. But now he could explore in safety. On rediscovering the cavity in the floor, Stoletsky's only thought was to find a way through to the levels below and Ivan's secret labyrinth of white stone. There had to be another chamber underneath made of that same white stone. The lifelong underground explorer was in his element. This was the breakthrough Stoletsky had always dreamed of. At last, he was about to penetrate the heart of Ivan the Terrible's labyrinth. I mean, he must have been ecstatic. Just as he'd expected, the tunnels were lined with white stone. Ivan the Terrible's library was hidden somewhere behind the walls. He must have been absolutely passionate about trying to find this, as any scholar would do. Every door he opened, every hatch he lifted, every stone he unturned, his heart must have leapt thinking he'd found things. Stoletsky then writes a report to the Commandant of the Kremlin. The tunnels, which I have been dreaming of for 25 years, have been found. I have broken through four and a half centuries of mystery. Stoletsky told Pettersson that it would take months to explore every inch of the tunnels. There was a clear danger from collapsing walls. Anything can happen in a tunnel that's four or five hundred years old. The floor can collapse under you, the roof can come in, the props can fall apart because they've rotted through. The risks are huge. As the weeks passed, Stoletsky's team suffered terrifying accidents. If the worst happened and the roof came down, they were as good as dead. If you were doing underground exploration, the roof caved in, well, your chance of rescue was pretty slim. And if you're a long way underground, it can take hours for rescuers to get to you, by which time it's game over. The excavation team soon tired of Stoletsky's relentless quest. The workers didn't really care about Ivan the Terrible secret library. Why on earth should they be buried alive working for this crazy man? Stoletsky drove himself close to exhaustion, but he had to keep going. He knew that everyone in the Soviet Union was living on borrowed time. By 1934, Stalin's paranoia had reached its peak. He used the death of a key rival, Sergei Kirov, as a pretext for mass murder. In the great terror that followed, at least one million people died. Under torture, Stalin's old comrades from the revolution confessed to treason. After public show trials, they were brutally executed. In Stalin's Russia, the price of failure was death. In Stoletsky's reports to Commandant Pettersson, he made rash promises that results were just around the corner. March the 2nd, 1934. Everywhere, we see the white stone ceiling of the Kremlin tunnels. The library of Ivan the Terrible is about to be found. Stoletsky had evidence that he was closing in on Ivan the Terrible's greatest secrets. In the deep recesses of the labyrinth, he'd found old weapons, possibly dating from the late 16th century, a period when Ivan, like Stalin, had slaughtered his enemies in the Kremlin dungeons. This was at the time of Ivan's great terror, when his secret police, the Oprishniks, were murdering thousands and thousands of his opponents. The only place more secret than Ivan's dungeons was the library itself. Stoletsky was convinced it had to be nearby. He says, I'm sure that I'm on the verge of a great discovery. 
Stiletsky pinned his hopes on one last dig through the surrounding walls. The culmination of his lifelong quest. But the result was a catastrophe. Excavations had hardly begun when the workers struck a well directly connected to the underground river nearby. That must have been a really terrifying moment, all that water starting to pour in um, to the space he was working in. Stiletsky's only desperate thought was to find the library and somehow save the books. At the very point, but he is so close to finding the library he had been looking for for so many years, he could have destroyed it himself. It was a hopeless situation. Stiletsky's team could do nothing except run for their lives. This is going to be a river, it's an unexhaustible supply of water, and it was really time to get out. Within reach of his dream, Stiletsky was forced to leave the Kremlin behind. The Commandant shut down the excavations. He has literally undermined the Kremlin, causing damage to, to, to the substructure. And Stalin, with his henchmen, were immediately above his head. Stalitsky is now very close to a total mental and physical breakdown. The aim of his life seems to be out of reach. For months, as workers labored to repair the damage, Stalitsky was forced to wait at home. He was living in fear, not just for himself, but for Ivan the Terrible's library. Stileski is terrified that the library will flood, or else that the workers might seal off some of the vital passageways. He says, the sword of Democles is hanging over the library of Ivan the Terrible. Stileski was hoping against hope that somehow he could survive the disaster and pick up his quest. The only thing that can save him now is a phone call from the Kremlin, from Peterson, saying to him to carry on with his excavations. And then the phone call comes. But the man on the line wasn't Peterson. There was a new commandant in the Kremlin. In 1935, in Stalin's Russia, this could only mean one thing. Peterson was as good as dead. In the Great Terror, Stalin saw every high-ranking official as a rival. Peterson had too much power to be allowed to live. For that crime, there was no reprieve. A bullet in the, in the, in the back of the neck was the only possible punishment. In the chaos of the Great Terror, Stiletsky himself disappeared from history. In the worst case scenario, he too had been executed or had simply vanished into Stalin's prison camps, like countless others. They disappeared all the time and uh, they would just walk out of their house to, the, to buy a loaf of bread, never to be seen again. Had someone like Stiletsky disappeared, I mean, it would have been completely unnoticed. In the late 1950s, after Stalin's death, the mystery of Stiletsky's whereabouts was finally solved. A Moscow journalist rediscovered Stiletsky's diaries. They detailed his lifelong struggle through the upheavals of Russian history and his early years training as an archaeologist in Jerusalem, the ancient city where Stiletsky first learned of the sacred texts in the libraries of Ivan the Terrible. I think that's really where he got the bug and uh, where he went, which went and drove him on to uh, look for Ivan the Terrible's library. For the first time, the diaries revealed that Stiletsky had a family. The journalists tracked them down 
at his last known address on an old Moscow street. It was right by the Kremlin, within view of the Arsenal Towers. Stiletsky's wife filled in the last tragic chapter in his story. Thwarted in his quest, Stiletsky had filled their home with his strange underground finds. A broken man, he'd cocooned himself in the secrets of the Kremlin. This sort of obsession, which is probably bordering on madness, you know, that's, that's the Russian scientist for you, you know. At the end, Stiletsky's mind seemed to have failed. He was losing the ability to even communicate. Shortly before his death, as his wife re later recalled, he started mumbling and bumbling something incoherent. But this story gave the journalist an amazing idea. Remembering Stiletsky's work in Jerusalem, he tried speaking a few words of Arabic to Stiletsky's puzzled wife. And she suddenly remembered one word. That's it, she said. That's what he said, Maktaba, Maktaba. Stiletsky had not been babbling. He knew exactly what he was trying to say. Maktaba. It's the Arabic for library. Stiletsky believed in the library to his dying breath. In his own mind, he was still on the quest. And in modern Moscow, his legend lives on. Moscow has a very active community of uh, underground explorers called the Moscow Diggers. And of course, they're still looking for the fabled legend of Ivan the Terrible's library as well. The Diggers are still playing Stiletsky's old game of hide-and-seek with the rulers in the Kremlin. They're still on the hunt for the lost library of Ivan the Terrible. Just because Stiletsky never found Ivan the Terrible's library doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. The library of lost masterpieces may still be waiting to rewrite the pages of history. I do believe that Ivan the Terrible's library existed and still exists and still can be found. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that it did exist. Ignaty Stiletsky may one day receive his final vindication. <laughs>